Hello everyone, my name is John Lowe. I am a PGY4 emergency medicine resident at OSU Medical Center and today we will be going over some injury patterns commonly seen in trauma. I have no disclosures. We'll talk about some cervical spine injuries. We'll talk about injury patterns in thoracic, abdominal, head injuries. We'll go through some specific fractures and dislocations. We'll talk about some splinting techniques. We'll go over a little bit of PEDS trauma, and then we'll touch briefly on non-accidental trauma, and we'll go from there. Uh, I will tell you this is a fairly long lecture, so if you need to take a break in there, there will be opportunities as it's broken up in this pattern, so you can stop and, re and resume as necessary. Um, but we'll dive in here. Uh, we'll start with cervical spine injuries. Um, Spine, obviously, we'll talk some anatomy, contains 33 different vertebrae, 7 cervical, uh, 12 thoracic, 5 lumbar, and then the sacral and coccygeal. Um, generally increase in width, uh, cranial caudally. Again, you've got your normal curvatures that you learned during anatomy and OMM. Uh, a review of uh, some of the cervical uh, C1 and C2 osteology here. Um, again, cervical vertebrae are involved in nodding and lateral flexion movements that occur at the atlanto-occipital joint. Um, rotation of the skull occurs at the atlanto-axial joint around the dens, which acts as a pivot point. So those are important to remember. Uh, cervical C-spine injuries uh, carry a double threat. So you can damage not only the vertebral column, but you also can damage the uh, spinal cord there. Uh, movement may cause or aggravate neural lesion, hence the importance of establishing whether the injury is stable or unstable. Uh, and we should assume that all uh, cervical spine fractures are, sta are unstable until proven otherwise. So how do we assess stability of C-spine injuries? A stable injury is one in which the vertebral components will not be displaced by any normal movement. In a stable injury, the uh, neural elements are undamaged, and there is little risk of them becoming any further damaged. However, an unstable injury is one in which there is a significant risk for displacement and consequent damage uh, to the neural tissues. So, mechanism of injury is important. Traction injuries, um, do they have some sort of uh, traction on the neck or spine? Did they fall and catch themselves on something, and, and they got a an extension type injury of the, or a, I'm sorry, a traction injury of the neck there where it pulled it apart. Direct injury would be something like a penetrating trauma. Did they get shot in the, the, the neck? Did they get a, a stab wound to the neck? These are unfortunately becoming uh, increasingly more common. Uh, so it is something to be aware of. Then there's indirect injuries, and these are the most common causes of uh, cervical spine injuries, and this is from a variety of different forces that can be applied to the spine, often simultaneously. So again, you can get lateral compression, you can get flexion rotation, um, extension, pure flexion, uh, flexion distraction injuries, um, and then axial compression injuries. Um, those all can cause different types of uh, fractures that affect different things, but they they are significant. Uh, insufficiency fractures may occur with minimal forces and bones which are weakened by osteoporosis or some sort of uh, pathological lesion. Um, so again, understanding the mechanism of injury is important. So finding out whether they fell onto the head, did they fall, take a blow to the forehead, did they get stabbed or shot? Like what is the, the mechanism of injury? This is why it's so important. So. Principles of diagnosis and initial management. So diagnosis and management of cervical spine injuries go hand in hand. An inappropriate movement and examination can irretrievably change the outcome for the worse. So again, you, if there's concern for C-spine injury, you want to treat it as though there is a C-spine injury until you can prove that there isn't. Um, so maintaining that midline traction, not having the patient move around uh, or do a bunch of things are, are important. So early management, control of airway breathing and circulation is necessary. Um, we talk more about that in the trauma resuscitation lecture, but making sure that you uh, immobilize the spine and do the slightest, um, you don't do anything that will do any further damage until you have identified and treated any other life-threatening injuries and have had time to uh, 
address that spinal potential spinal cord injury and cervical spine injury appropriately. So radiology, um, radiology gold standard used to be uh, plain film, so you would get a lateral view where you would see to get an adequate lateral view, you had to see the top of T1. You would see that the three uh, arcs of the uh, vertebral column were maintained. Um, vertebral body, bodies were all uniform height, and the odontoid is intact and closely applied to C1. The AP view, you can see the spinous process is straight and equally spaced, with uh, intervertebral spaces roughly equal. And then you would get the odontoid view and make sure that the odontoid is intact. I think we have some pictures here, so you can see this. Uh, you've got the blue line here, the anterior vertebral line. Um, then you've got the uh, red line here. This is the posterior vertebral line. And then you've got this green line here. Um, that is the uh, um, spinal laminar line. And they should follow this slightly lower dotted cor curve uh, without any what we call step off. So you see that none of these are stepping off of the other, sticking out. Um, no pathological fractures or anything uh, concerning for ligamentous injury or occult fractures or anything there. So there you can see the uh, pre-dental space. Uh, according to the textbooks, it should be three millimeters or less. Your disc base heights are equal and symmetric down through there. Again, preferred tebral soft tissue swelling. You don't. There's the retrotracheal, retropharyngeal, and nasopharyngeal spaces are all maintained. Um, there's measurements for these, but I'm not going to go through any of those. Again, here's your AP view. The vertebral heights are all the same. Uh, the height of the joint spaces should be roughly equal at all levels, and the, the tr uh, transverse processes are uh, all in line and equal. Here's an odontoid view. Uh, you can see here that you can see the odontoid here. Um, should include the entire odontoid and the lateral borders of C1 and C2. You want to make sure that the occipital condyle should line up with the lateral mass and superior articular facet of C1 over here. The distance from the dens to the lateral mass of C1 should be equal. So either side should be equal here, there, and there. Tips of lateral mass of C1 should line up with the lateral margins of superior articular facet of C2, again, out here. And the odontoid should have uninterrupted cortical margins blending with the body of C2, so down through here. So that's an odontoid view. These are fairly common questions on, on board exams. Possibly common on the COMAT is that they will show you a picture of this and ask you if there's an unstable odontoid fracture, um, just so you have an idea. These spaces should all be the same. So now we'll go into some specific cervical uh, fractures. So this is a Jefferson fracture. It is a compression fracture of the bony ring of C1. Um, it is typically an axial blow to the vertex of the head. From So these are common diving injuries or somebody drops something heavy on their head. Um, but this is it causes this uh, compression fracture. Um, it's best seen on the odontoid view of a plane film. Um, however, I'll preface this lecture by saying most of the time, if you're concerned about C-spine injury, the gold standard now is CT of the cervical spine. So a lot of the cervical uh, plane films are going away, and you will get a CT for any concern of actual cervical spine pathology. Um, again, signs displacement of the lateral masses of the vertebral C1 beyond the margins of the uh, body of vertebrae C2. Uh, CT is required to define the extent of that injury. Um, Pain in the neck, usually without uh, clinical presentation, is usually pain in the neck uh, without significant neurological signs. Treatment, um, this can be uh, stable, unstable. We always treat it as an unstable fracture. Um, you have to find out if the transverse ligament is broken, then it's unstable. Um, and then you end up having uh, skeletal traction, halo vest, or surgery. Um, by neurosurgery, but all of uh, any time you see a Jefferson fracture, it's a surgery uh, neurosurgery consult and discussion. Um, sometimes they'll have soft hard collar 
uh, cervical collars. It just depends. But you can see here that these don't match where they're supposed to. These should be lined up. These are sticking out. Again on CT, here's the fracture. This is this should make a a nice ring. It obviously does not. Um, and again, these are sticking out past where uh, where they should be. These should be lined up. Now we'll go on to a hangman's fracture. Uh, this is a fracture through the pedicle at the pars interarticularis of C2, and this is caused by hyperextension injuries. Um, this is it's called a hangman's fracture because this is the fracture that was typically obtained by people who were hung. Um, they can also be obtained by uh, some type of hyperextension, like hitting a dashboard or an old person falling and and hyperextending their neck on as they hit their head on something as they fall. Um, but it is it is an important one. It's best seen on lateral plane films or on CT neck. You will see prevertebral soft tissue swelling, avulsion of the anterior inferior corner of C2 with the rupture of the anterior longitudinal ligament, uh, anterior dislocation of C2 vertebral body, and bilateral C2 pars interarticularis fractures. So after reduction, the neck is held in a halo vest until union occurs. Um, there's a bunch of different uh, bunch of different collars out there that, and vests that they use. But this is a very unstable fracture. So you can see here, they just it it breaks it in half. Again, C2 pars interarticularis fractures with anterior dislocation of the C2 body and narrowing of the uh, or the prevertebral soft tissue swelling here. Uh, so again, fracture here, anterior dislocation, anterior soft tissue swelling. Uh, odontoid fractures. Um, this is the fracture of the DINs or the odontoid process of C2. It's best seen on lateral views or a or odontoid views. Um, there is this Anderson and Alonzo classifications that break them into three types. So your type one is a fracture through the very superior portion of the DINs. Uh, this is a stable fracture. Uh, type two and type three are both unstable fractures. Um, type 2 is a fracture through the base of the dens, most common and most dangerous. It's prone to non-union. Uh, typically requires uh, operative reduction and internal fixation. Uh, type 3 is a fracture that extends into the body of C2. Um, also, they say it's stable, but it's it's not always. So, type 3, type 2, type 1. So now we have burst fractures. Um, these are fractures anywhere from C3 to C7 that result from some type of axial compression. A CT is required for all patients to evaluate the extent of the injury. Um, this can also require uh, MRI at times um, because you can get retropulsion of the, the burst fracture down backwards into the cord and causing injury to the spinal cord. Uh, and it is pretty common. Uh, typically, these do require neuro neurosurgical intervention for, um, sometimes they go in for laminectomy and then posterior fixation. Again, you've got two cortical lines here, the fracture line, so you can see this, this burst fracture here. And then you can see how it's retropulsing back into the spinal cord. Here on CT, fracture line, retropulsion. Uh, clay shoveler's fracture. Uh, this is a uh, fracture of the spinous process of uh, C6 to T1. This is caused by powerful hyperflexion, usually combined with some type of contraction of the paraspinous muscles. Uh, That's why it's called a clay shoveler's fracture, is because it can be seen in shoveling type injuries. This is stable. Um, best again seen on lateral views they uh, can have this ghost sign on the AP view meaning you see a double spinous process of C6 or C7 resulting from the the spinous process not much to do on these 
but you can see it down here there's the fracture wedge fracture uh, this is a compression fracture resulting from hyperflexion um, with some associated compression uh, usually they have a buckled anterior cortex with loss of height of the anterior vertebral body um, Again, here you can see the buckled anterior cortex and the loss of vertebral height compared to the others. Um, not uh, not much to do with these either. It's just kind of uh, neurosurgical evaluation and monitoring. So flexion teardrop fracture. Um, so flexion teardrop fractures. Um, these come from posterior ligament disruption and anterior compression fraction of the vertebral body, which results from some type of severe flexion injury. Um, again, these can be caused by uh, dive injuries um, from that hyperflexion with compression. Uh, best seen on plane films on the lateral view. You'll get prevertebral swelling associated with this, an anterior longitudinal ligament tear. Uh, you can see a teardrop fragment from the anterior vertebral body that's a small avulsion fracture. Um, You'll see some posterior body uh, subluxation into the spinal canal with spinal cord compression um, and fracture of the spinous processes here. So again, you can see it right here, just a teardrop off the anterior portion there, uh, spinous process fractures right there. Um, not a not a good thing. Here's another one, teardrop posterior displacement of the vertebral body, widening of the joint facets. So anterior subluxation. This is a disruption of the posterior ligamentous complex resulting from, again, a hyperflexion injury. Uh, these are difficult to diagnose because muscle spasm may result in similar findings on the radiograph. may be stable initially, but it is associated with a 20 to 50% delayed instability. Um, Flexion and extension views are helpful if you are concerned for these. Um, again, CT is going to be the, the standard, but sometimes uh, neurosurgery will ask for flexion extension films. Um, signs, again, loss of cervical lordosis, anterior displacement of the vertebral body, and fanning of the interspinous distance. Com bilateral facet dislocation. Um, again, complete anterior dislocation of the vertebral body resulting from extreme hyperflexion, very high risk of core damage, best seen on lateral view. Um, complete anterior dislocation of affected vertebral body by half or more, and disruption of the posterior ligament complex and the anterior longitudinal ligament, and it says it's got this bow tie or bat wing appearance of the locked facets. Big anterior uh, dislocation. I back here you can kind of see the locked facets. I don't know what it means by bat wing, but that's this is that appearance of that bilateral facet dislocation. Unilateral facet dislocation. Um, it's a joint dislocation and rupture of the apophyseal joint ligaments resulting from a ro rotatory injury. Um, again, best seen on lateral or, or oblique view. You get anterior dislocation of the affected vertebrae by less than half. Discordant rotation above and below involved level. You get a facet within the intervertebral foramen on oblique view and widening of the disc, disc space. So again, less than half overriding, widening of the spinous processes. Okay. Um, cervical fractures. Um, Again, these are some of your uh, classifications, just a little chart to help you with uh, some of the common cervical spine fractures, um, knowing which ones cause what. Um, your unstable fractures, just so that you're aware of this, there's a good mnemonic, is the Jefferson bit off a hangman's thumb. Um, so that's going to be your Jefferson fracture. It's going to be your bilateral facet dislocation. It's going to be your odontoid type 1 and type 2 fractures. 
it's going to be your atlanto occipital dislocation and then it's going to be your hangman's fracture and your teardrop fracture so that's your jefferson bit off a of hangman's thumb and that should help you with whether or not a cervical fracture is unstable or stable all right now moving on to thoracic trauma and we'll keep uh, trucking through this thoracic injuries uh, they result in a fifth to a quarter of all deaths from trauma um, the early death is often preventable in the first 30 minutes to three hours these are likely from tension pneumothorax cardiac tamponade uh, some sort of airway obstruction or an unrecognized or untreated uh, intrathoracic hemorrhage uh, so rib fractures not rib fractures are not fatal on their own uh, but it's the complications that come from rib fractures that can be fatal no, they can cause pneumothorax they can cause hemothorax they can cause significant pulmonary contusions uh, and then they have uh, significant uh, risk for post-traumatic pneumonia uh, just due to inability to take deep breaths and uh, anatomic splinting so they can get atelectasis and pneumonia which can cause uh, long-term mor morbidity and mortality ribs typically break at the point of impact or the posterior angle children have a uh, more compliant chest wall so they likely don't have as many uh, rib fractures but they can still get the intrathoracic injury so they can get the pulmonary contusions they can get the pneumothorax they can get those things but they don't always have the rib fractures associated with it um, elderly have a significantly increased mortality from rib fractures so again here's ribs uh, four through nine are most vulnerable to fraction fracture uh, nine through eleven are associated with some intra-abdominal injuries uh, you may need to CT those if there's high concern. And 50% of rib fractures are not seen on initial chest x-ray. Um, so you can see here on this radiograph, it, the black arrow sign is showing you where all these rib fractures are. Uh, treatment is going to be uh, encouraging deep breathing uh, and frequent incentive spirometry. Um, no binders, belts, ACE wraps, or restrictive devices. Um, if they have three or more consecutive rib fractures, uh, we'll likely need admission at least for OBS for monitoring overnight, um, sometimes longer than that. Uh, good pain control is going to be, a, be key in these. We try to avoid as narcotics as much as we can, but likely times they may need some narcotic adjuncts on these, but things like lidoderm lidoder patches, uh, muscle relaxers, um, lots of things to do. You know, if they're young and otherwise healthy, you could try Toradol, um, things that might help them be able to move and breathe a little bit better. Most ribs heal somewhere within the first six weeks. Sternal fractures, uh, this is likely from uh, restrained drivers, sometimes from unrestrained drivers who strike their chest on the steering wheel, um, but it's uh, an isolated sternal fracture is relatively benign. Um, and does not always imply other major life-threatening conditions, but they do have some uh, association with uh, a myocardial contusion. Um, about 1 in 10 will also have some sort of spinal fracture, and about 21% will have associated rib fractures with them. Um, management, usually CT chest, if it's non-displaced, can go home. If it uh, is significantly displaced or has bad overlying bone fragments they may need operative fixation typically you'll check an EKG and a troponin on these patients also just to make sure they don't have a myocardial contusion or anything bad or scary uh, flail chest we talked about this some in the trauma lecture but this is uh, a fracture of three or more adjacent ribs at two different points um, meaning that the same rib is fractured in two areas over a course of two to three ribs um, and this is going to cause this paradoxical movement um, so when they inspire and their chest is moving chest wall is moving outward you're going to see that flail segment uh, move inward and when they go to expire and the chest is sink the chest wall is moving inward you're going to see an outward movement of that uh, flail segment um, 
this is uh, almost always seen in conjunction with a pretty severe pulmonary contusion. Uh, treatment is stabilization of that segment. You can use some bulky dressing sometimes if necessary. Um, if it's that paradoxical movement, you can you can try to help assist with some of that. Um, likely not going to need to do anything but good pain control and then uh, pulmonary support. So making sure that, that you've got, you're giving them oxygen as needed, good pain control, and incentive spirometry. Uh, so like we said, aggressive pulmonary physiotherapy, uh, good analgesia. Nerve blocks are up and coming and incredibly helpful, especially in patients with rib, blo with rib fractures. If you can get anesthesia to do uh, a rib nerve block or like a uh, erector spinae block or something like that, that can help a, a ton with these patients. Uh, they may need like positive pressure support, so CPAP or intubation. There is some operative uh, fixation. Some places will do rib plating, but the majority of them uh, are usually just um, um, supportive care. Mortality is somewhere around 8 to 35% based on underlying and associated injuries. So pulmonary contusion. Uh, this is a direct bruise to the parenchyma of the lung. Um, Many of the worst pulmonary contusions actually can occur without rib fractures, um, but they can come with or without them. Chest x-ray findings usually begin within minutes of the injury. Um, they're always present within six hours of the injury. Um, this can progress to significant uh, respiratory distress, including ARDS with delayed onset up to 72 hours post-injury. Um, on ABG or VBG, they can be hypoxic. Um, you can see um, on ABG, there is the widening of the alveolar arterial oxygen difference. So you can just tell that they're not, their AA gradient isn't doing well. Um, these patients typically, if they're, if they have a bad pulmonary contusion, then they, they need to be observed in the hospital for a day or two just to watch for this progression into ARDS and respiratory distress. So you can see it here on x-ray. Um, they've, they've got this opacification of the lung here. Um, it's concerning for a pulmonary contusion. Here on uh, CT scan, you can also see it here down at the base. Um, you can just see that how it's, it's bruising of the lung parenchyma itself. And then that can rapidly progress to this picture where they have uh, ARDS in it. So management, they talk about this dual lumen endotracheal tube. Um, not typically something that's done much anymore. It's usually just endotracheal intubation with positive pressure. Um, you can do ECMO as necessary if they're not ox oxygenating well. You want to restrict these patients' IV fluids over... Uh, Giving them too many fluids can actually worsen their their respiratory status and uh, worsen their outcomes. So you want to do uh, aggressive pulmonary toilet uh, suctioning, and then do your best to prevent any over secondary uh, infections like pneumonia. Talking about pneumothorax here, um, 15 to 50 percent of chest trauma patients may have a pneumothorax at some point. Um, you can have a simple um, pneumothorax, which is just somebody who comes in after trauma who popped a bleb, or you can see simple pneumothorax in patients who are atraumatic, who have respiratory disease, and, and pop a bleb and come in with a pneumothorax. You can have communicating pneumothoraxes, which is a defect in the chest wall, like a gunshot or a stab. If they're large enough defects in the chest wall, they can cause these second, sucking chest wounds where air is entering through the hole in the chest wall instead of in through the trachea. Um, those require occlusive dressings followed by chest tube placement. And then there's tension pneumothorax, which is where you're getting uh, shifting of the mediastinum with compression of the contralateral lung and great vessels. Um, this decreases diastolic filling and decreases cardiac output and can cause cardiac arrest. Uh, chest x-ray, you want to get an upright chest x-ray on it. You want to do, uh, you can do an EFAS exam. Uh, 
Um, you can do an expiratory film, expiratory chest x-ray, which reduces the lung volumes, may help you see a pneumothorax that's there. CT is gold standard. You can see a pneumothorax on that really well. Um, repeat chest x-ray uh, may be necessary if you're concerned about an, a pneumothorax or if you identify a small pneumothorax that's present. Um, then if you, you're giving them oxygen therapy, you want to get a repeat and just make sure it's not progressing. Um, CT scanned, you don't need to worry about doing a repeat. Uh, observation, if they're hemodynamically stable and asymptomatic with an apical pneumothorax less than 25% or have an occult pneumothorax that's only found on CT, then um, you can just watch them, give them high flow oxygen, and usually that will get better on their own. Um, if it's anything other than these, if they're symptomatic or having hemodynamic instability or they have a larger uh, pneumothorax, then you need to be doing some type of intervention. Typically, it's chest thoracostomy. The books always talk about going bigger, uh, 36 to 40 French tubes in adults, 16 to 32 French in children. Um, that is not always the case. So if there's concern that you, I mean, the larger the tube, the more uncomfortable it is for the patient. Um, so you want to make sure that you're trying to take that into consideration as well. So if there's concern that this may be a hemo pneumothorax, you're still going to want to put a large bore tube in, but typically a 32 French, a 30, or somewhere between a 28 to a 38 French uh, tube will work for an adult, even with a hemothorax. Um, in children, again, still you want to try to go 16, 18. Um, you don't want to go with the biggest tube you can put in there most of the time. Sometimes it's indicated, and there's uh, there's a reason why they do, but most of the time you can get by with somewhere around a 28 to a 32 on an average size adult. Um, again, you want to direct the tube posterior and, and uh, cephalic. Um, you want to make sure that you're going towards the, uh, the apex of the lung because that will get more of air and liquid. Um, Typically, if you're putting it in, you're going to put them to continuous uh, suction and watch for air leak. Antibiotics are plus minus. Typically, if they're a bad trauma patient and they have penetrating chest trauma, they'll get some type of antibiotic coverage. Um, usually something like Zosin or, or Ansef or, or one of them. Um, pneumothorax over three days old. Um, you want to make sure that you slowly re-expand that. Um, it can cause a re-expansion pulmonary edema. You don't want to just completely re-up the lung and cause them to go into, a, into that pulmonary edema. So you don't hook them to suction. You just let them kind of, you give them positive pressure with the chest tube in and let them re-expand that lung uh, slowly. Tension pneumo, uh, the book still says that needle decompression, uh, needle thoracostomy is the is the gold standard to start, even though you always follow it up with chest thoracostomy. So you want to make sure that you're taking a 14 gauge needle in the second or third intercostal space going over the top of the rib and you puncture through the chest wall until you get a return of air, advance the catheter, remove the needle, and then take that in place. Um, you can also go at the uh, fourth or fifth intercostal space in the mid, -axillary, mid to anterior axillary line which is now the preferred place for needle decompression as well. Hemothorax, again, hemorrhage from an injured lung parenchyma is the most common cause. Um, you'll see blunting of the costophrenic angles on an upright chest x-ray, but only after they've had two to 300 mLs of fluid in there. Um, any residual blood in the chest cavity is a nidus for uh, empyema or fibrothorax. Again, the book says you should use a large bore tube. Most of the uh, of the thoracic surgeons and trauma surgeons are now going slightly smaller, so they're going more with like a 32 French instead of a 40 French, um, just for patient comfort, and it doesn't worsen any outcomes. Thoracotomy. Um, if you have an initial output of over 1500 mLs of blood when you place your chest tube, or you have persistent uh, output of more than 200 mLs for multiple hours, um, 
or if the initial drainage is more than 20 ml per kilo or 7 ml per kilo per hour, um, then there's an indication for a thoracotomy. Um, you can do a VATS procedure, which is a video assisted uh, thoracoscopy, uh, to see if it's not. It doesn't necessarily require an open thoracotomy or thoracotomy um, at bedside in the emergency department. Usually that would be an op a reason to go to the uh, operating theater for um, for intervention there. There is this auto transfusion, so you can auto transfuse that blood if the patient is exsanguinating in front of you. You can actually take that blood back from the uh, from the atrium and transfuse it back into the patient. Um, it's not something that's commonly done at most smaller facilities, but it, it can be done. And, and according to the books, it should be done. Uh, tracheal bronchial injuries. Uh, this is most commonly caused from uh, some type of blunt mechanism, usually within about two centimeters of the carina. The this will happen when the chest tube fails to evacuate. Like you'll know, it's when the chest tube fails to evacuate the pneumothorax, and you get continuous bubbling of the air in uh, the atrium or the water seal device. This requires bronchoscopy to uh, diagnose and surgery to fix. Diaphragmatic injury, uh, only 10% are diagnosed in the acute phase. It may not be diagnosed until many years later. Most of them are on the left side due to the protective effects of the, of the liver. These are repaired through laparoscopy. Myocardial concussion we talked a little bit about. Uh, this is an intramyocardial hemorrhage, just like a bruise. It can lead to edema and necrosis. Most heal spontaneously. You can see an effusion in about half of them during the second week. Uh, you can have some scar formation that leads to a delayed ventricular rupture. Um, necrosis in the second week can lead to delayed sudden death. Uh, diagnosis is usually done on autopsy. Uh, sometimes it's done by biopsy. Most of them do not cause any clinically significant complications. Uh, EKG findings are typically sinus tachycardia. You can get uh, cardiac markers, or you should get cardiac markers if you're concerned about this. A normal EKG and troponin rule out a myocardial contusion. Uh, you can do an echo for wall motion abnormalities. Myocardial rupture, um, typically it's the ventricles that are most commonly involved. Um, one in five will have multiple chambers involved. You can get aortic rupture with this as well. Uh, survival is based on pericardium. Uh, one third of these patients will have pericardial tears. Um, two thirds may have a, uh, an intact pericardium that can sometimes protect them from an exsanguination, but it still has an extremely high mortality rate of about 80%. Uh, features of this, you're gonna hear a very harsh murmur. Um, they call it a Bruy de Moulin, Moulin um, the splashing mill wheel sound. Um, they'll have hypotension JVD. Um, they'll appear to have uh, pericardial tamponade. Um, most survivors uh, are ones who had atrial rupture and not ventricular rupture, and were within, or were, and were in surgery within uh, three to four hours of the injury. Acute pericardial tamponade. Um, Cardiac tamponade, again, Bex triad, hypotension, JVD, muffled heart sounds. It, does, can take, it doesn't take very much blood at all to cause this. Um, it is all dependent on the, um, the rate of accumulation and not the amount of accumulation. If you rapidly get 50 to 60 mLs of blood into the pericardium and the heart can't adjust, you can get cardiac tamponade. Um, diastolic collapse of the right ventricle or atrium. Uh, you can see this electrical alternans on EKG. It's not required, but it is uh, pretty uh, specific. This Again, you perform a pericardiocentesis. Mostly it'll be clotted blood. Um, even if you can get 5 to 10 mLs out, uh, it can significantly help. And that ultrasound on the bottom, you can see it's just causing uh, a little bit of collapse there and quite a bit of blood around the of the heart inside the pericardium. So thoracotomy indications, um, penetrating traumatic cardiac arrest with signs of life in the field, 
uh, a blood pressure of less than 50 systolic after they've been fluid resuscitated, severe shock with signs of tamponade, um, survival is about 10%, better with stab wounds than gunshot wounds. Um, if they lose pulses within five minutes of the hospital, five to 10 minutes of the hospital, you can do this. Uh, or if you have witnessed arrest in the, uh, in the department, um, after penetrating chest trauma, then you can consider doing a, uh, ED thoracotomy, uh, blunt, tr blunt trauma with cardiac arrest has a survival of less than 1%, uh, literature is mixed, but right now the recommendation is that it's not necessary to do a thoracotomy. Um, and then potentially if there's concern for some sort of air embolism, blunt aortic injury, um, about 90% of these patients die within hours. Um, most occur in the descending order at the isthmus, just distal to the left subclavian. Um, you'll find widened mediastinum, uh, on, uh, chest x-ray. Um, these patients don't do well and typically, uh, die very quickly. Um, again, these are some more findings, multiple rib fractures, tracheal deviation, uh, depressed left main stem bronchus, obscured aortic knob might lead you to do it. Testing, a CT scan, you can do a transesophageal echocardiogram. If you have access to that in the emergency department, most places do not. Uh, you can do intravascular ultrasound or aortography. Um, management is like any other uh, aortic disruption there, you want to keep the systolic blood pressure and heart rate as low as they can tolerate. Esmolol uh, decreases that pulse pressure to minimize shearing forces. You can add on additional ones. The books were saying nitroprusside still, but a lot of times they're not really using nitroprusside. They're using one of the other ones like uh, uh, Cleveprex. Surgery. Um, if there's spinal cord ischemia and paraplegia, um, they are doing more endovascular repair with stenting, um, more than open repair, but it's still high mortality. All right, now we're moving into abdominal injuries. Esophageal perforation. Um, this is the most rapidly fatal GI perforation, uh, likely to have significant morbidity and mortality if delayed uh, diagnosis more than 24 hours. Even with good diagnosis, mortality is about 20%. Causes of esophageal perforation, um, typically they're iatrogenic, um, sometimes foreign bodies or uh, caustic burns. Um, a lot of times in trauma, it's from uh, shearing forces and or um, penetrating chest trauma. So gunshot wounds or stabs need to be concerned for potential uh, GI perforation. Uh, Borhovs, that's your older person who drinks a lot and it's a distal esophageal tear um, and then post-op breakdown from anastomosis uh, a lack of esophageal cirrhosis recovering allows direct access to the mediastinum uh, it's got thin mediastinal pleura negative pleura. pressure in the chest promotes drainage from GI tract into the pleural space uh, diagnosis is with a gastrographin study or endoscopy Um, abdominal trauma uh, is about 15 to 20 percent of all trauma deaths. Your liver is your most frequently injured organ. Um, usually death occurs secondary to hemorrhage. Uh, second peak of death in abdominal trauma is due to sepsis and it can be from blunt or penetrating. So blunt trauma here we see um, most commonly is motor vehicle accidents all organs are at risk because in, in motor vehicle accidents, you get all kinds of forces. You get sharing and stretching forces. You get compressive forces. You can get penetrating forces. Um, they're, they're not good. Um, falls, typically you'll see hollow viscous rupture is one of the most typical abdominal injuries. And then the autopeds, um, again, can have significant blunt trauma. Penetrating traumas, uh, any stab wound in the lower chest, pelvis, flank, or back 
can cause abdominal injury until proven otherwise. Um, any organs in proximity to the presumed trajectory of a gunshot wound should be considered injured. Injured, and then you got to have this idea of uh, secondary missiles, which are, can be either uh, bullet or bone fragments that may cause additional injuries in places that are somewhat un unexpected. So, solid organ injuries. Um, these are uh, signs and symptoms uh, usually due to blood loss. Um, blunt solid organ injuries bleed slowly, um, such as liver liver lacerations or things, or mainly liver lacerations. Um, sometimes you'll actually see these patients present with uh, shoulder pain. So they'll complain of right shoulder pain following something, and it's because they actually have a blunt liver injury that's irritating the diaphragm and causing uh, referred pain. Uh, here's that chart of classes of hemorrhagic shock again. Again, not clinically useful, but it is testable material, so kind of look over that and know it a little bit. Um, young patients... Uh, can lose a significant amount of blood, uh, 50 to 60 percent of their blood volume, and remain fairly asymptomatic. Um, hypotension may not occur until 30 to 40 percent in uh, decrease in volume, and um, really, some patients in their belly may have uh, hours to days of asymptomatic with blood in their belly, um, but others may have immediate tenderness to palpation. It's, it's kind of hard to tell on those. 35% um, of blunt trauma patients will have a benign abdominal exam on initial physical exam, but will have some significant injury requiring laparotomy. Hollow viscous injuries, um, blunt bowel and mesenteric injuries are present in approximately 5% of, uh, of abdominal traumas. Uh, this can symptoms can be from blood loss or peritoneal contamination. Yeah, you may it may take up to six hours for some of those inflammatory uh, changes to take effect. Um, delays in diagnosis of hollow vis visceral injuries are associated with increased mortality. Retroperitoneal injuries uh, may be subtle or completely absent uh, as, as far as physical exam findings initially. Duodenal injuries are often contained into the retroperitoneum. Um, High-speed vertical or horizontal deceleration injuries put them at high risk. They will eventually likely get abdominal pain, fever, and tenderness to palpation, but it can take a long time. Um, usually it can take a few hours for that hematoma or, or whatever to start expanding, and then they'll start getting signs and symptoms of gastric outlet and and uh, peritonitis so just keep it in mind that it's not always a uh, initial presentation Diapha diaphragmatic injuries um, uncommon and tough to diagnose um, typically they if they're bad enough they'll have dyspnea orthopnea and chest pain um, chest x-ray you can actually see viscera in the chest if the diaphragmatic rupture is big enough and you can see the ng2 coiled in the thorax sometimes um, this one you can actually see the swallow study and it's up the <laughs> it's in the esophagus here and then it's up into the in the thorax over here um, almost exclusively left-sided due to the protection of the liver on the right again um, this is one that you have to be careful if you didn't have this gastrographin study and you didn't have this in there. That could easily be mistaken as a pneumothorax um, when that's actually bowel up in the chest cavity. And you'd want to be careful there because you do not want to stick a chest tube into that. Um, that would be poor form. Evaluation of blunt trauma. So again, uh, do they have abdominal pain, tenderness, or distension? You always want to respect the mechanism of injury. Um, motorcycle collisions, um, motor vehicle accidents, autoped, was there ejection? Does the patient have any distracting injuries? Are they altered? Is there any drugs or alcohol on board? And are they elderly? I mean, these are all um, concerning things that you need to be addressing. Um, always respect mechanism. Um, 
ask EMS, was it a high-speed collision or was there substantial deformity of the vehicle? Um, are they elderly? Um, this is one, if they're an elderly patient, uh, always, always be respectful of elderly patients. They can't tolerate misdiagnosis very long. Um, and a lot of them also have uh, underlying health problems. Many of them are on anticoagulations. Uh, anticoagulants are, are uh, antiplatelet therapy. So make sure that you're just you're respecting that on the elderly patients. So physical exam findings. Uh, your exterior findings act as clues to the severity of the mechanism and injury. A uh, single abdominal exam is unsensitive, so you may admit these patients for serial abdominal exams over 24 hours. You can check serial hematocrits and vital signs. Because, um, uh, like we talked about, up to 40, 30 to 45 percent of blunt trauma patients will have benign abdominal exams on initial evaluation. So, rapid identification of rat free intraperitoneal fluid and uh, pneumothorax. Um, can lead you for indications for additional imaging. So if you have an unstable patient who had this uh, this fast exam, they would be going immediately to the operating theater for um, exploratory laparotomy. Um, your bedside ultrasound is an incredibly powerful tool, especially in trauma evaluation. Use it for what it is and help it guide your therapy. CT, um, the diagnosis machine, the donut of truth, um, uh, it's got an incredibly high accuracy. Um, it is an ideal study to, uh, to check for retroperitoneal injury. Um, many, many trauma patients deserve to get, uh, at least a CT scan of the chest and pelvis. Some of them will still get pan scanned depending on mechanism, but you want to make sure that you're identifying, um, these intraperitoneal, uh, or abdominal traumas and injuries. As you can see here, um, there's just a this liver has a lot of blood in it and all around it uh, there on that left CT. Um, you can see blood here uh, in the retroperitoneum by the kidney. You can see uh, some injury to the hollow viscous here. Um, these are injuries that would need exploratory laparotomy to or further management to go and, and look. So um, just making sure that you're identifying all of the, the reasons. Stab wounds, GSWs. Um, stab wounds, you can do local exploration on exam. If there is no fascial violation of an abdominal stab wound, um, you do not necessarily need to perform an X-lap. You can do local wound care and close it. And a lot of times these patients can actually be discharged home. Um, but if there's fascial violation, then CT is warranted and washout and closure. Um, so these are the the depth and extent of the stab wound is incredibly important to to assess. Gunshot wounds, uh, transabdominal GSWs, uh, they go to surgery at some point because you want to ensure there's so many uh, hollow organs and and issues that can come from it. You they need to run the bowel and, and check things out. So almost universally a, a transabdominal gunshot wound will go to XLAT. Um, again, all patients with persistent hypotension, um, abdominal wall injury, abdominal wall disruption, or peritonitis will probably need to go to laparotomy. Um, there's a table from Titanales there on the right that's talking about um, absolute indications for laparotomy for blunt and penetrating trauma and then again relative ones there on the bottom uh, Reboa this is a good chance to talk about that um, it's an endovascular balloon occlusion um, so it is a gone in percutaneous they put it into the artery usually the femoral artery it's ran up the aorta and used to occlude the aorta uh, to increase perfusion to the heart and lungs and um, decrease uh, arterial bleeding from one of the major arteries, either in the abdomen or the pelvis. Uh, three zones, they're the descending aorta between the subclavian and the celiac. Uh, 
Zone 2 is the celiac to the lowest renal, and Zone 3 is the lowest renal to the aortic bifurcation. Um, these are useful for things like pelvic fractures, um, other things, because you can go up below the renal arteries, inflate the balloon, cut off that blood flow to the pelvic arteries, take the patient straight to the uh, operating theater, obtain uh, hemostasis, or take them to the IR suite and coil that, and then uh, drop that balloon. Um, 30 to 60 minutes is the magic number for Reboa. It can't be up that long or else it causes significant damage long term. But um, it is an interesting thing that's being used as an adjunct in therapy and trauma treatment. Okay, now we're moving into head injuries. About one and a half million people a year sustain significant head injuries in the United States. Uh, about one in five of them are hospitalized. Um, about 52,000 each year die from uh, traumatic brain injury. It is the leading cause of death in patients younger than 25 and accounts for about one third of all trauma deaths. A uh, little bit of anatomy review there. You've got your different uh, cranial bones, uh, just to kind of remember where things are. You've got the different layers of the meninges in the skull, so you can kind of go down there through from the pia mater to the arachnoid, dura, bone, periosteum skin, um, just kind of remembering where the different levels are. So when we say subarachnoid or subdural, like where are they bleeding? Um, another little um, quick anatomy and physiology review. Um, again, Dura, arachnoid, and pia, the define the uh, pathological conditions of traumatic hematomas. Um, the brain is suspended in CSF. Um, it's, the CSF is produced by the choroid plexus. It maintains the microenvironment of the brain. Um, the blood-brain barrier protects the, the brain and the CSF from uh, the rest of the bloodstream, typically tries to help keep the, uh, the brain away from the uh, infections or other things. Um, brain does have a high metabolic rate using approximately 20% of entire oxygen volume consumed by the blood and 15% of the total carbon uh, monoxide, or I'm sorry, cardiac output. Um, trauma can disrupt blood-brain barrier, can cause cerebral edema, uh, can cause infection, it can cause a lot of bad things. Um, Cerebral vessels can be altered um, by changing diameter to different conditions. Um, uh, hypertension, alkalosis, hypocarbia all cause cerebral vasoconstriction. Hypotension, acidosis, and hypercarbia all cause vasodilation. Um, we can use those to our advantage when we're dealing with uh, traumatic brain injuries. So brain cellular damage, again, the goal in the emergency department is to prevent systemic conditions that are known to worsen outcome after TBI. Um, common common uh, systemic insults include hypotension, hypoxia, uh, anemia. Uh, so systemic hypotension in this case is defined as less than 90, and it reduces cerebral perfusion leading to ischemia and infarction. Uh, presence of hypotension nearly doub doubles mortality from head injuries, so keeping that in mind is important. Uh, a PO2 of less than 60 uh, can be caused by uh, apnea from brainstem compression, airway obstruction, or chest wall injury. That also worsens outcomes. Uh, and then anemia. If your hematocrit is less than 30, it reduces the amount of oxygen carrying capacity of the blood and reduces the amount getting delivered to the injured brain, which an injured brain is going to require even more metabolic demand than a uh, regular brain does. ICP, or increased uh, uh, intracranial pressure, is defined as a pressure greater than 15 millimeters of mercury. Um, this is a frequent consequence of severe head injury. Um, methods to reduce intracranial pressure, you can do conservative measures such as uh, reducing, I'm sorry, elevating the head of the bed to 30 degrees placing the patient in reverse Trendelenburg. Um, you can hyperventilate the patient to an extent. Um, this can transiently reduce uh, 
uh, intracranial pressure by about 25% in most patients. However, prolonged hyperventilation can lead to significant vasoconstriction and ischemia, so it should only really be used temporarily for acute management if the patient is showing signs or concern for herniation until you can get a more uh, permanent uh, agent or intervention on board. Um, you can do osmotic agents such as mannitol or 3% uh, hypertonic saline. Um, it prevents those prevent water from the vascular spaces um, into the cells and draws it into the vascular spaces, reducing brain volume, which reduces intracranial pressure. Um, and then there's cranial decompression, which is either burr holes or um, uh, craniotomy. And then, of course, you want to make sure that you're doing appropriate seizure prophylaxis. Most trauma and neurosurgeons are using Keppra for seizure prophylaxis and TBIs now. So uh, increased ICP, you get Cushing's reflex, which is going to be uh, significant hypertension, bradycardia, and a decreased respiratory effort um, seen in approximately one-third of patients. Um, cerebral herniation occurs when the ICP can't be controlled, causing the contents of the brain to herniate through different cranial foramen. Um, uh, uncle herniation is the most common, usually caused by ipsilateral compression of the uncus of the temporal lobe, leading to compression of the third cranial nerves. Um, that can cause anisocoria, ptosis, uh, decreased ocular movement on the ipsilateral side with a contralateral Babinski's eventually ending up leading to brainstem compression. You can also get central trans transcentorial uh, cerebellotonsillar and then upper transcentorial herniations, um, all of which are bad. So history and physical exam, again, mechanism of injury, uh, comorbid factors uh, such as uh, are they coagulopathic for some reason? Uh, are they on some type of anticoagulant? Um, you want to assess their current level of consciousness. That's going to be using their GCS scale. Um, you want to assess their level of consciousness before and after the event. Did they have um, transient lance loss of consciousness on scene? Did they have uh, retrograde amnesia? Uh, do they have anterograde amnesia? Do they remember what was going on? before and after the event, um, all of those things are important. Uh, on these TBI patients, uh, performing and documenting a very thorough neurological exam is incredibly important. So mental status, GCS, pupil size and responsiveness, um, motor strength and symmetry, uh, sensation, deep tendon reflexes, sphincter tone, Babinski's, um, all of those things are going to be incredibly important for prognostication and uh, communicating with your neurosurgeons. Um, severe TBI is a head injury with a uh, GCS of 8 or less at the acute presentation after an injury. Uh, this is approximately 10% of all uh, TBI patients with mortality being around 60%. Um, severe TBI is actually on the side note, the most common reason for helicopter transfer in trauma care. Management, um, again, safety net and ABCs. These patients are uh, GCS less than 8 following trauma, so you want to secure their airway by rapid sequence intubation. Um, book does talk about Atomidate being a good sedative because it can help lower intracranial pressure a little bit. Um, Really, any of the agents are good. Um, you want to avoid uh, hypotension, so treating these patients with IV fluids. Um, um, systolic blood pressure should be remaining above 90. Uh, you want to do your trauma labs, your CBC, CMP, coags. Um, blood alcohol if indicated, urine tox if indicated, all of the other ones. Uh, any any adult with a head injury and a GCS of less than 15, the book says, should undergo CT imaging. Um, 
Moderate head trauma, this is approximately another 10% of all patients with head injuries, um, often caused by motor vehicle accidents. Uh, these patients often, often experience loss of consciousness, progressive headaches, maybe some vomiting and post-traumatic amnesia. Uh, CT is essential on these patients. So this is defined as a GCS of 9 to 13. Um, they may be confused when they initially arrive, but most of the time they'll follow commands they may have some mild facial injuries, but they're able to to kind of talk and, and do do well. Um, they also may be the ones that come in and they're talking and then deteriorate. Um, they may be have they may have a 13 or a 14 GCS on presentation and deteriorate to the st status of severe head injury within 48 hours. Um, so uh, close monitoring and uh, clinical reevaluation is important. Minor head trauma. Uh, temporary and brief interruption of neurological function after head trauma. Uh, this is a patient who has a GCS of 14 to 15. They may or may not have loss of consciousness. Uh, most patients have symptoms that are resolved by the time they reach the emergency department, except for most commonly headache, nausea, and vomiting. Um, may have a mild amount of post-traumatic amnesia. Um, most neurosurgeons advocate liberal CT scanning in patients with minor TBI. Um, most practical approach is going to be selective scanning if the patient is low risk, awake, not intoxicated, with no significant neurologic findings, um, no obvious skull fracture. Imaging is not going to be significantly indicated in that. If medium risk, they're having headache, vomiting. If the patient's older than 60 or on anticoagulants or antiplatelet therapy, they're intoxicated, they have significant me memory deficits. Uh, any other signs of trauma above the clavicle, they had a seizure, um, then scan them. Uh, most of these patients with mild uh, or minor traumatic head injuries uh, can be discharged home with normal exam in a short OBS period of about four hours. Um, there are some clinical decision tools out there to help with these. There's the Canadian head CT rule. Um, there's the PCARM pediatric head CT rule. These can help kind of guide you as far as risk benefits of, of head CTs. Um, concussion. This is defined as a type of minor TBI, usually caused by acceleration de or deceleration or rotational injury to a freely mobile head, is most commonly associated with uh, sports collisions. Um, patients complaining of headache, dizziness, confusion, maybe some amnesia, they almost uh, universally have non-focal neurological exams. Um, kids may be restless, confused, irritable. Um, they may also be uh, vomiting, they may appear pale, they may be tacky. Sometimes irritability may be the only symptom or sign. Um, these patients typically have more persistent symptoms than those with just a minor TBI. Um, second impact syndrome is important to discuss with parents and athletes. This is what happens when an athlete can uh, sustains a second concussion um, before complete resolution of their initial symptoms from the first one. This can lead to rapid neurologic decline and moderate to severe TBI. Um, this is where the return to play recommendations came from um, and uh, and all the, the stepwise return to play algorithms that the primary care and uh, sports medicine folks are doing. Um, Athletes really shouldn't be allowed to play for at least one month if they had any loss of consciousness or amnesia. Peds head, in, head injuries. Uh, TBI accounts for the largest source of childhood mortality and morbidity after other traumas. Um, uh, children's skulls are more distinguishable than those of adults. Uh, again, inflicted injury is the most common cause of head injury deaths in infants, so non-accidental trauma is the most common cause of head injury death in infants. Um, children, because of their skulls being more distinguishable, uh, may often sustain less TBI after head trauma than an adult, but it's something that should always be considered. Um, any child abuse should be considered in any unexplained injury or inadequate history. Um, some findings consistent with shaken baby syndrome, subdural hematoma, no external trauma with retinal hemorrhaging. Peds injuries uh, management, so again, avoiding hypoxia and hypoventilation are 
these are common in Pete's head's injury, and they develop more rapidly in children than adults. Um, want to monitor and avoid too high increased ICP. Uh, infants, you can check the fontanelle. A bulging fontanelle suggests increased uh, uh, intracranial pressure. Can also ca you can also start seeing uh, bradycardia. You can see some decreased level of consciousness. Seizures are late findings. Um, you can see papal edema as well. Uh, mannitol uh, is indicated in kids to help monitor that. Burr holes are ineffective in kids because diffuse brain swelling is the most common finding in severe TBI. Um, scalp hematoma can indicate a potential brain injury. So in peds, if they have a severe scalp hematoma, it may indicate, may have an uh, indication for CT imaging of the head. Scalp wounds uh, can lead to massive blood loss. Uh, I've seen patients on anticoagulation with uh, fairly minor scalp lacerations that bleed and bleed and bleed and end up requiring um, blood transfusion because of the amount of blood loss that they have. Um, digital exploration should be carefully performed. Um, stable patients require quick closure after proper debridement. Um, can repair with 3 -O, uh, or 4 -O suture or staples if the galea is not involved. Uh, antibiotics not typically needed because the scalp has such a rich blood supply, infection is rare. Um, you don't want to put too much pressure down onto the scalp either though, because you don't want to, if there's an underlying fracture or concern for underlying fracture, don't press because you don't want to cause any depression if there's a skull fracture there. Basal skull fractures or basilar skull fractures. Uh, this is a linear fracture at the base of the skull, usually occurring through the temporal bone. Um, it can cause bleeding into the middle ear, which is hemotympanum. Other signs that you can see is CSF otorrhea or rhinorrhea, and that'll be that clear fluid leaking from the uh, ears or the nose. And you can do some like spot testing on that to see, to look for a halo sign or other things to see if it has a. Uh, CSF coming out. Uh, late findings would be battle sign, which is ecchymosis behind the ear over the mastoid area, or uh, raccoon eyes, you know, bilateral periorbital ecchymosis. So those are all concerning findings for a, a basal skull fracture. If they have clear fluid coming out of their nose or ears, um, this can lead to meningitis. Prophylactic antibiotic should be given. Uh, rocephin and vancomycin is acceptable. Now we're talking epidural hematomas. Um, these are blood clots that form in the potential space between the skull and the dura mater. Uh, most are caused by direct impact, causing a forceful deformity to the skull. This can lead to herniation within hours. Uh, this is most commonly in the temporal parietal region with disruption of the middle meningeal artery is the most likely site. Uh, classic history is someone who had blunt head trauma with loss of consciousness followed by a brief lucid period and subsequent rapid neuro demise. Um, that's only in about 30% of patients fall into that category, but that is one of the classic board presentations of it. CT will show this biconvex football shaped hematoma. Subdural, this is a blood clot that forms between the dura mater and the brain. This is most commonly in elderly or alcoholics. Uh, can be classified as acute, subacute, and chronic. Um, these are caused by movement of the brain relative to the skull and sudden acceleration deceleration injuries causing tearing of the bridging, bridging veins located within the subdural space. You'll see this crossing of the uh, you'll see this crescent shaped hematoma that crosses uh, suture lines, whereas epidural hematomas typically will not cross suture lines. Um, these patients typically have extensive brain atrophy, which exposes those bridging veins and makes them weak. Acute subdural patients are usually symptomatic within 24 hours, have rapid loss of consciousness. They may or may not have lucid periods in there. Subacute are symptomatic between 24 and two weeks, and chronic are greater than two weeks. Um, patients may have 
progressive altered mental status and gradual decrease in consciousness for for chronic uh, subdurals. Subarachnoid, um, traumatic subarachnoid results from the disruption of the parenchyma and subarachnoid vessels and presents with blood in the CSF. Uh, detected on first CT and up to 33% of patients with severe TBI. Um, CT scan is almost 100% sensitive for subarachnoid hemorrhage in the first uh, six hours. It's looking like out to 12 hours. It is going to be 98 to 99% sensitive as well. So subarachnoid is, or CT is a good imaging study for subarachnoids. Um, it is uh, the most common CT scan abnormality seen after TBI. Um, some patients will have post-traumatic vasospasm, which can lead to ischemia. Calcium channel blockers are used to reduce the vasospasm often seen in these patients. Um, so a lot of times these patients will be given uh, IV calcium channel blockers. They will likely present uh, with headache, photophobia, meningeal signs. Uh, Long-term complications after TBI, um, seizures can have meningitis, brain abscess, DIC, um, cardiac rhythm abnormalities. Um, patients who have subarachnoid hemorrhages, uh, almost 70% of them have some sort of cardiac rhythm abnormality with uh, the most common cardiac dysrhythmia being SVT. Um, Post-traumatic seizures, relatively common in the acute period, more commonly in kids. Uh, f there are multiple first-line medications now recommended. Uh, it used to be phenytoin, but now a lot of them are using Keppra. Um, brain abscess and cranial osteomyelitis can develop after penetrating head injuries uh, or skull fractures if certain parts of the bone are not removed. Um, this is just something to be aware of and monitor for. Uh, DIC can occur due to the source, brain being a source of thromboplastin, uh, which activates the extrinsic clotting system, and because of the damage to the brain, DIC can develop within hours. Disposition. Uh, all patients with severe head trauma require imaging and neurosurgical intervention. All patients with moderate head trauma should be admitted for monitoring, observation, even with a normal head CT. Minor head trauma after discharge should have a follow-up in one week. And let's see, we're in uh, sorry, this is supposed to be under fractures, so we're going to start fractures and dislocations now. Um, general principles, you want to assess for uh, fractures and other serious injuries. Um, performing a good detailed neurovascular exam on an extremity before focusing on an injured joint. You want to make sure you get pre-reduction radiographs uh, before doing anything. No rigid guidelines for use of pharmacologic adjuncts in management of dislocations or fractures. Um, in general, um, analgesia with or without sedation for majority of re reductions. Um, Alternatives to procedural sedation and analgesia include intraarticular injection of local anesthetics, hematoma blocks, or peripheral nerve blocks. Um, point of care ultrasound is being used more frequently to evaluate for fractures and dislocations. Um, dislocations are less common in children due to relative weakness of a ep epiphyseal growth plate compared to ligaments. Uh, the epiphysis usually fractures before a dislocation occurs. Uh, Proper terminology describes the relationship of the distal segment relative to the proximal bone or structure. Um, sooner a dislocation is reduced, the better. Uh, Orthoconsult if unsuccessful after two or three attempts. Aftercare includes adequate immobilization for comfort and to prevent repeated dislocations. <clears throat> so now we'll talk a little bit about shoulder dislocations. Most frequently encountered large joint dislocation in the emergency department. Anterior is more common than posterior. There's other types of shoulder dislocations, including superior, intrathoracic, and then this inferior. Um, um, anterior shoulder dislocations, usual mechanism is an indirect and consists of combination of abduction, extension, and external rotation. 
So there's four types of anterior shoulder dislocations. You've got your subcoracoid, uh, subglenoid, subclavicular, and intrathoracic. Um, subcoracoid dislocations account for more than 75% of all anterior dislocations. There is concern for the injury to the axillary artery, but it is a excessively rare. It usually occurs in elderly and can quickly be assessed by a decreased or absent radial pulse or by the appearance of an expanding hematoma. Um, you want to evaluate the status of the axillary nerve and shoulder dislocations because this is the most common nerve injury resulting from an anterior dislocation. Um, you want to assess the sensory component of the axillary nerve by testing for sensation over the lateral aspect of the upper, upper part of the arm and uh, over the deltoid muscle. You want to test the motor component um, as it requires activation of the deltoid muscle, but it, it is difficult in patients who have um, shoulder dislocations. Um, associated fractures are detected in about 15 to 30 percent of anterior shoulder dislocations with fractures of the greater tuberosity being the most common. There is this hill sacs deformity, a sign of repeated dislocations producing a groove in the posterior lateral aspect of the humeral head, may be seen on pre-reduction or post-reduction films. Um, disruption of the anterior inferior portion of the cartilaginous labrum of the glenoid or the inferior aspect of the bony glenoid, an injury known as a bandcart lesion, has been implicated as a source of recurrent uh, dislocations. So reduction techniques. Um, Hippocrates, uh, back in 450 BC, generally credited with the first detailed description of reduction techniques. Um, believe that the drawing in a tome of Upe is the earliest depiction of, um, of such a method. Uh, Hippocratic technique involves placement of the operator's foot in the axilla to allow counter-traction. Uh, this technique is problematic and not recommended. Um, lots of different techniques. Um, people will have their their preferred technique that they will kind of lock on lock onto. There's this external rotation. There's the Milch technique, um, traction counter traction, Eskim I mean, all of these that have different uh, different techniques that you can try. Um, my recommendation is that you learn one or two of them really well and be able to do them. Scapular manipulation actually has been shown to significantly improve patient satisfaction with it and also um, as an augment to any of these other ones doing some scapular manipulation actually improves the likelihood that you get a good reduction with it. Uh, posterior inferior uh, shoulder dislocations and reductions um, These are uncommon, uh, increases the risk of misdiagnosis. Classic precipitating event includes some type of seizure, electrical shock, or fall. It is important to get the scapular Y view or the axillary view. Uh, this inferior uh, luxation erecta are rare but clinically obviously obvious dislocations. That's what you'll see here in the bottom right picture. The patient's uh, arm will be marked in abduction with a flexed forearm with the arm laying somewhere back behind the head, and that's that inferior dislocation of the shoulder. Um, it is fairly easy to um, reduce that. Uh, basically, you just pull uh, superior traction, and the arm will pop out and back in. Um, posterior dislocations. There's this way of doing, um, basically it's traction with internal uh, movement and then some, another operator putting anterior pressure on it. AC joint subluxation or dislocation, there are six degrees or types. Um, type one is a minor tear, type two is a complete tear of uh, the AC ligament. Type 3 is a complete tear of both the AC and the coracoclavicular ligament. Uh, type 4, the distillant of the clavicle is free-floating and post posteriorly displaced into or through the trapezius muscle. Uh, 
Type 5 characterized by inferior displacement of the scapula with a marked increase in the coracoclavicular interspace, and type 6 involves dislocation of the distal end of the clavicle inferiorly. Um, in general, these injuries arrive from some type of direct force, such as a fall onto the point of the sh shoulder with the arm adducted. Um, uh, they're basically going to be managed in different ways. So type 1 uh, management consists of a sling, ice, and analgesics. Generally, the symptoms improve in 7 to 10 days. Orthopedic referral is not usually necessary unless there is a failure to return to normal function beyond two weeks. Type 2, usually treated in closed fashion with a sling. Orthopedic referral recommended for follow-up. Um, some still recommend a sling strap device that elevates the arm and depresses the clavicle, but usually just a sling and close follow-up with orthopedic surgery. Type 3, require orthopedic referral. A uh, fair bit of controversy regarding their subsequent management in the orthopedic literature, but that's outside the scope of emergency medicine. Uh, type 4 and type 5 dislocations generally require surgery, and orthopedic referral is necessary. Type 6, um, usually the result of a major trauma, and often other fractures are present, and you should be evaluating for those and consulting orthopedic surgery. Uh, sternoclavicular dislocations, despite the fact that the sternoclavicular joint is the least stable joint in the body, they're extremely rare dislocations. Uh, anterior dislocations are much more common. Um, posterior dislocations are also usually result from a blow to the shoulder, but can also be caused by a direct superior sternal or medial clavicular blow. Uh, posterior dislocation is potentially life-threatening because the injury to great vessel or compression of the airway might occur. Um, ath management um, of a posterior should be prompt surgical consultation. Um, patients with any uh, significant uh, complaints of dyspnea, choking, hoarseness, uh, dysphagia, or any numbness or, or neurologic findings should be uh, should have a uh, orthopedic surgery evaluation. Elbow dislocations, um, second most common major joint dislocation in adults, most common in children. Because of the stability of the elbow, any dislocation is expected to be accompanied by considerable soft tissue damage. Uh, associated fractures of the radial head and coronoid process are also common. Um, most commonly described as anterior or posterior, they can have lateral diversion and isolated radial dislocations as well. Um, posterior dislocation is the most common. It's usually caused by a foosh injury or a fall on an outstretched hand. Um, anterior dislocations are rare, usually result from a posterior blow to the electronon with the elbow flexed, uh, usually associated with significant neurovascular injury. Um, most common complication of elbow dislocation is injury to the brachial artery. Most cases, orthopedic consultation should be sought before disposition. Patients um, may have significant or immediate soft tissue swelling or hematoma form formation, and those who have questionable vascular integrity uh, often admitted to the hospital or ED observational unit. It is imperative to conduct a careful neurologic exam before and after reduction of, of elbow dislocations because... Um, it's difficult to clinically distinguish the cause of uh, neurologic findings from the median ulnar nerves because it could be due to stretch or severance or entrapment of the nerves from the injury. Um, oftentimes these are uh, just kind of expectant management and, and follow up. However, you want to make sure that if there's any change or increase in findings following a reduction, it may indicate an entrapment and the need for surgical intervention. So a couple of uh, elbow dislocation reduction techniques. Um, so for an anterior elbow dislocation, you want to uh, apply that inline traction and backward pressure on the proximal end of the forearm. Usually we'll get a pretty satisfying clunk once the uh, reduction is obtained. Then you flex the arm beyond 90 to ensure the joint has been reduced and splint the arm in at least 90 degrees of flexion with the posterior long arm. Uh, posterior dislocation reductions, uh, 
uh, you've got the you got three different methods there. So you've got the chair back method, where you hang the patient's chair over a padded arm back of a chair, and apply posterior uh, pressure to the posterior aspect of the electronon and downward traction. Um, you can do traction counter traction, um, or you can do um, that uh, initial point approach where they uh, say the patient's prone and hang the flexed arm off and you just do traction and um, flexion of the arm. Uh, radial head subluxation. This is a common pediatric orthopedic issue. Generally occurs between the ages of one and three, but can be seen from six months to preteen years. Um, mean age is just older than two. Um, slight predilection for this injury to occur in girls and in the left arm. Uh, classic mechanism of injury is a longitudinal traction on the arm with the wrist in pronation as occurs when the child is lifted by the wrist. Pathologic lesion is generally a tear in the attachment of the annular ligament to the periosteum of the radial neck, with the detached portion becoming trapped between the radial head and the capitulum. Uh, ultrasound may be diagnostic in radial head subluxation, the hook sign uh, caused by hyperechoic J-shaped supinator muscle has been shown to be 100% sensitive for the diagnosis of radial head subluxation, but is not commonly used in most emergency departments. Um, Radiographs are generally not needed. Um, two reduction techniques. There is the uh, supination or, hyper, uh, or hyperpronation. So you can supinate and flex the arm, or there is hyperpronation. It seems that hyperpronation is actually more uh, tolerated and has better outcomes, but either method can be used to uh, reduce a nursemaid's. Hip dislocations um, usually result from some type of significant force, uh, usually a bad fall, uh, MVC or a vehicle versus pedestrian. Um, fractures are common with hip dislocations, usually uh, almost up to 90% of them. Um, common dislo or complications of hip dislocations include sciatic nerve injury and avascular necrosis of the femoral head. Uh, sciatic nerve injuries are seen with approximately 14% of posterior hip dislocations. Uh, sedation, usually required to reduce, can range from IV to general anesthesia. Uh, sometimes a fascia iliaca block can be uh, successful in that. Uh, posterior hip dislocation is most common. Uh, blow to a flexed knee with the hip inflection. Anterior is significantly less common. There's three types. You've got the iliac subspinous, the pubic, and the inferior or obturator. Um, that is caused by force abduction of the thigh. Um, for an anterior hip dislocation, you can do the uh, modified Alice technique that is demonstrated there below. Um, for a posterior hip dislocation, you've got, uh, you also have an Alice technique there. They have the Stimson technique. Um, commonly used ones are Whistler or Captain Morgan, uh, as, as shown there. Um, usually these patients will need some type of uh, sedation to help assist with relaxing those large muscles to get the, the hip back in place. Knee dislocations, um, rare due to strong ligamentous support. Usual mechanism of a knee dislocation involves a great deal of force, such as motor vehicle crash or sporting injury. Um, obese patients more likely to dislocate a knee with surprisingly minor trauma. You have five types, anterior, posterior, lateral, and medial rotary. Um, reduction, reduction technique is almost always traction. Um, knee dislocations are almost always clinically obvious. A grossly unstable knee that does not appear to be dislocated is probably a reduced dislocation and carries the same risk for vascular and other complications. Um, most important part of the clinical assessment is the vascular ex status of the extremity. Uh, nerve injury is less common, but peroneal nerve injury is recognized as a complication, particularly with a posterior lateral dislocation. Uh, should be suspected the patient is unable to dorsiflect the angle, ankle or has decreased sensation on the dorsum of the foot. Uh, always the most common, and or not common, but the most feared complication of any dislocation is internal injury of the popliteal artery. Um, 
good physical exam, but there's no clinical, uh, no clear consensus on whether uh, CT angiography, ABIs, or or what the uh, what the appropriate imaging study is. Um, typically, if there's concern for for disruption of the popliteal artery, then in the emergency department we will get uh, CT angiography to look for disruption and then orthopedics consult. Patellar dislocation, fairly common, especially in adolescence. Usual mechanism is a qu powerful quadriceps contraction combined with a strong valgus or external rotation component, uh, such as making a cut in sports or dancing. Um, lateral dislocations are the most common by far. You can get superior medial and inter intercondylar. Um, reduction of a lateral patellar dislocation is usually quite simple. Uh, Pre-medication not required if the patient can be verbally reassured. Basic maneuver is uh, extension of the knee and gentle medial pressure applied to the patella. Um, orthopedic follow-up is necessary because of the need for physical therapy and the high rate of persistent instability. Um, fibular head dislocations. Uh, the fibula joint can be dislocated at its proximal articulation in the knee joint, most commonly an anterior lateral dislocation. Um, on radiographic examination, the three cardinal signs of anterior lateral dislocation are lateral displacement of the fibula on an AP film, a widened proximal interosseous space, and an anterior displacement of the fibular head on a lateral view. If high clinical suspicion exists for fibular head dislocation, um, CT is the next study of choice. To reduce an anterior fibular head dislocation, you place the patient supine and flex the knee to 90 degrees to relax the biceps femoris, dorsiflex and externally rotate the foot and apply direct pressure to the fibular head. Reduction is usually signified by a snap. Um, method for reduction of a posterior dislocation is the same except that direct pressure is applied in a forward direction. Should not bear weight for two weeks and receive orthopedic follow-up. Ankle dislocations, uh, ankle joint, modified saddle joint in which the talus sits. Ligament to support of the ankle is quite strong and pure dislocations are uncommon. Usually there are associated fractures of the ankle joint. Um, ankle dislocations are described by a relationship of the talus to the tibia. Um, posterior dislocations are more common than anterior and they usually result uh, from fall on a plantar flexed foot. Anterior dislocations generally result from forced dorsiflexion or a blow directed posteriorly onto the distal end of the tibia while the foot is flexed. Uh, superior dislocations are uncommon. Um, they're, um, because they're uncommon, clinicians should search for concomitant calcanea or, or low spine fractural fractures. Uh, lateral dislocations of the ankle are always associated with fractures of the malleoli or distal end of the fibula. Unless a strong indication is present, it is advisable to administer IV sedation and analgesia to patients with an ankle dislocation early in their care, preferably, be, preferably before conducting any manipulations or radio, radiologic studies. Reduction is always painful in an awake patient, and sufficient pre-medication must be administered. For posterior dislocations, place the patient supine and flex the knee slightly to relax the Achilles tendon. Um, grasp the foot with both hands, place one hand on the heel, the other on the forefoot, apply traction, and have a second assistant apply downward pressure on the distal end of the tibia. For anterior dislocations, the initial steps and positioning are the same. However, uh, instead of plantar flex, dorsiflex the foot to free the talus and have them put upward pressure on the distal end of the tibia when the operator applies traction and pushes the foot posteriorly. The orthopedic consultation is... Um, recommended. Hand and foot dislocations. Uh, hand is extremely susceptible to dislocation injuries. Uh, thumb dislocations, you can have the IP, MCP, and CMC. Um, CMC dislocations are uncommon, requires operative stabilization. Um, MCP joint, you can have simple and complex, you can have volar dislocation, and you have issues with the ulnar collateral ligament rupture, which will require uh, close follow up with orthopedics. An ulnar collateral ligament rupture is also called a game, 
gamekeeper's thumb or a skier's thumb. It's usually laterally directed force at the MCP of the thumb. Um, typically cannot be diagnosed in the ED, but it is it is prudent to immobilize uh, all significantly sprained thumbs and a thumb spike for a few days and re-examine with uh, and re-examine those with significant injuries. Uh, here's some more finger and foot dislocations. So you've got fingers, you've got the proximal interphalangeal, the distal interphalangeal, the uh, metacarpal phalangeal, and the carpal metacarpals. Um, lots of different dislocations there. You can have multiple uh, fractures and dislocations. Usually uh, volar or uh, lateral PIP dislocations. Uh, volar and PIP dislocations are uncommon, almost always accompanied by injury to the central slip of the extensor tendons. You want to split this in full extension with early uh, ortho follow-up. Uh, lateral, usually reduced in the field, and you buddy tape for three to six weeks with ortho follow-up. DIP dislo dislocations are frequently open, can be reduced similar to the thumb reduction. Don't overlook mallet finger or rupture of the extensor tendon. Um, MCP, same classification applies and management is the same. Volar uh, dislocations require ortho consult. Carpal metacarpal dislocations are rare. Most usual is fifth metacarpal dorsal dislocation. Um, carpal dislocations, uh, again, dislocation and dissociation of the, uh, of the carpal bones are significant injuries. The most common carpal injuries are scapholunate dissociation and lunate and perilunate dislocation. Uh, specific intervention to establish anatomic alignment is usually undertaken on diagnosis or within a few days of the injury, so identification in the ED, initial splinting, and proper referral are important. Uh, scaphoid dissociation is serious, frequently missed injury that is characterized by a widened space between the scaphoid and lunate bones on a plain, plain film. So you can see here, scaphoid dislocation on the left, you just got the widening between the scaphoid and the lunate. Um, that's one that should be approximately the same size there. Uh, lunate dislocation seen here. This is also the spilt cup. You can see that the lunate is now not where it should be. The radius and the uh, the capitate are are lined up appropriately. Um, and then here you can also see the uh, perilunate dislocation where the capitate is not sitting up in the lunate where it should be and the radius and the lunate are lined up. So remember lunate dislocation is, the, is your spilt cup. The, the, the lunate is now tipped over where it shouldn't be. Uh, treat toes the same way that you would treat fingers. Uh, specific foot dislocations are uh, Taylor dislocations in the Liz Franck. Uh, so te tarsal metatarsal fracture dislocation uh, causes included uh, motor vehicle accidents, fall from significant height, athletic injuries, usually caused by indirect rotational forces and an axial load through a hyperplanted flex foot forefoot. Um, Taylor dislocations, extremely rare. Uh, talus is essentially extruded from its normal position and comes to lie anteriorly. This injury is generally open and not amendable to closed reduction and almost always progresses to avascular necrosis. A talectomy and arthrodesis are often required and orthopedic referral should be undertaken on an emergent basis if vascular compromise of the foot is present. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about some splinting techniques. These should not take too long, so we'll hopefully be able to move through this fairly quickly for you. Indications. Anytime you want to immobilize uh, something, so whether it's a fraction or a dislocation, a sprain or severe soft tissue damage, uh, deep laceration that crosses over a joint, uh, anything that's a tendon laceration or a deep space infection or cellulitis over a joint, um, you typically want to do non-circumferential immobilizer for stability and protection. Um, but splinting is better than casting for acute fractures due to the allowance for swelling. Contraindications and considerations, uh, do they have an open fracture, is there concern for compartment syndrome, uh, any localized infection, uh, or a history of neuropathy. Um, uh, operative, are they going to be having any type of operative management, is there 
pressure of splint causing progression of neurovascular compromise, um, things like that. Disposition, uh, pain control, ortho follow-up, uh, splint care instructions and repair and precautions. You want to discuss with them symptoms of compartment syndrome and reasons to come back for recheck, signs of any local or systemic infection or intractable pain. You always want to talk to them about elevate, icing, early mobilization. You want to talk to them about the signs of compartment syndrome being pain, pallor, pulselessness, paresthesia, paralysis, um, any of the systemic signs of infection. Complications. Um, you want to be careful because you can cause plaster burns, um, distal ischemia, pressure ulcers or skin maceration, edema, nerve palsies. Um, fiberglass sets up in about three to four minutes. Plaster sets up in about five to ten minutes. Um, you want to be cautioned because all of these cause exothermic reactions. So edema, uh, you can see there, there's edematous lines on the patient. You can see the patient's foot there on the left is swelling. There's a lot of edema. So you want to allow room on your splinting for swelling to occur. And that's why we typically splint instead of cast. So procedurally, uh, these are some of the things you're going to need. So you'll have your stockinette, you'll have your soft roll, you'll have your splinting material, ACE wraps, um, and then always your repeat neurovascular exam. So you want to document a pre and post splint uh, neurovascular exam just to be able to say that there was consistency there. Uh, so let's go with a posterior long arm. Uh, indications are distal humerus, supracondylar, electronon, or elbow dislocations. Um, uh, placement is going to be proximal humerus to the uh, uh, MCP on the uh, posterior aspect. Uh, elbow is going to be flexed to 90 degrees, wrist extended 0 to 20 degrees. Um, thumbs up position, uh, you can add an anterior aspect of the splint there uh, for radius ulnar fracture to prevent any pronation or supination. Uh, never use the anterior alone. But so this is the example of that posterior long arm. So it's just running down the posterior aspect of the arm from about mid uh, proximal uh, humerus there, mid proximal humerus all the way down and around to uh, mid MCP. So double trigger tongue. So this is an arm, you know, distal humerus, uh, supracondylar, uh, olecranon fractures, this or some elbow dislocations. Again, this is just like doing a posterior long, except for you're doing it all the way around. So you're doing what's called the sugar tongue, and it runs up from uh, the uh, posterior aspect of the MCP down and around the elbow, up along onto about mid palm. Um, you want to make sure that your elbow is flexed to 90 and your wrist is extended some in there. And then you're going to put uh, a second sugar tongue around from mid, mid uh, humerus to mid humerus. And then that gets wrapped up. Volar splint. These are going to be soft, ish, soft tissue injuries to your hand and wrist. Uh, any of the triquetral uh, metacarpal fractures, uh, lunate or perilunate dislocations. Um, any of those are going to be placed into a volar splint. Um, the metacarpal heads to the proximal forearms, wrist extension in 10 to 20 degrees. You can add a uh, posterior aspect to this as well if you would like to for further stabilization of uh, maybe a, uh, a bad uh, metacarpal fracture. But that's your volar splinting there. Um, Thumbs or forearm sugar tongue. Sorry, this is your distal radius and ulnar fractures. Uh, again, um, metacarpal heads to the MCP joints. You want your elbow at 90, forearm neutral, and wrist extended. Um, this prevents pronation supination. Um, pretty good after a forearm fracture. Thumb spica. Uh, indications are going to be for lunate, uh, scaphoid concerns. So any tenor, anytime somebody has a fall on an outstretched arm with tenderness over the scaphoid or in the anatomic snuff box there, they will likely get a, uh, a thumb spica splint just to make sure that they're not moving that and you don't get that avascular necrosis associated with it. Um, so it's going to go around the thumb. Um, as you can see there, it kind of wraps around the proximal aspect of the thumb and then runs up the uh, 
uh, up the mid forearm past the IP thumb joint there. You want the wrist to be extended in about 25 degrees and your thumb to be in the wine glass position there. So kind of just like it's sitting there holding a glass. Ulnar gutter, these are good for your fourth and fifth metacarpal fractures or any serious damage to the ring or pinky finger. Um, so like your boxer's fracture or anything like that is this is a good one for that if it's a fifth metacarpal fracture. Um, you want to put gauze between the two digits. You wrap the arm with good pre-wrap. Um, you go to the distal to the DIP of the fourth and fifth digits and then up to the mid forearm. You want a neutral forearm wrist extended to 15 to 20 and MCP flexion to about 50. Radial gutter, uh, similar indications are going to be so your second and third metacarpal uh, phalangeal fractures, um, serious injury to the index or middle finger, and uh, placement again gauze between the digits, distal to the DIP, neutral forearm, wrist extension to 20, MCP flexion to 50, um, PIP and DIP flexion 10 to 15. And it just kind of wraps there around your thumb and down the uh, radial aspect of the of the arm. So here's a figure of eight thumb spica that you can do. This is for uh, uh, skier or game tapers if you're concerned for that ulnar collateral ligament. So you want to make sure that you've got your hand kind of sitting there in that wine glass position as, as demonstrated. And then you just kind of uh, put your cotton, cotton padding down and your plaster strip, and then you then you bandage that up really well. Finger splinting, so you got buddy taping with a gauze padding there. If you have concern for um, there's your uh, mallet finger, so you want to extend it and or splint it in extension, and then um, the dorsal splint also allows. Uh, for any like finger fractures that you need to splint and then the outrigger finger splint there is needed. So lower extremities you got a posterior long or a posterior knee. Um, this is for any angulated fracture around the knee uh, for temporary stabilization prior to OR or knee injuries with habitus too big for an immobilizer. Um, so you want this to go just below the buttock crease to three centimeters above the malleoli. Um, you can also do bilateral splints along the medial and lateral aspects instead of just the one on the posterior. Um, posterior ankle splint or posterior long. Um, you want to make sure that it's for any distal fibula, tibia, uh, severe ankle sprain, or reduced ankle dislocation. So you go from the plantar surface of the great toe uh, to the level of the fibular head, and you want the ankle to be at 90 degrees. So here's an anterior posterior ankle. That's severe fractures of the ankle. Um, so you want the posterior portion uh, to be just like a posterior lung. And then the anterior portion from the uh, metatarsal joint to the level of the uh, fibular head. So kind of hold it in place there. Uh, this is a stirrup or sugar tongue. Um, this is going to be fractures of the distal tibia, uh, fibula, post-reduction ankle. Um, Again, medial shin just below the fibular head to lateral shin. Um, ankle at 90 uh, can extend to sides of knee for long leg. Um, this is commonly used in conjunction with the posterior, so you've got a posterior with a sugar tongue just for added support. A uh, walking boot can be used for uh, soft tissue injuries and um, non-displaced lateral mal fractures. It's similar support to the immobilization of a U-splint, but is easier for the patient to remove. You can use those uh, air casts or semi-rigids for ankle sprains, and then ACE wrap uh, for ankle sprains. Uh, hard toes, you can use post-op shoes uh, for pa patients who have uh, non-castable foot fractures. Now we'll talk a little bit about pediatric trauma here. Um, about pediatric trauma, half of children's death do occur because of uh, accidents and trauma. And of those trauma deaths, half of those are from MVCs. Um, the most common single organ injury causing death is uh, brain injury.
So because of pediatric uh, anatomy, forces more widely distributed throughout their body, uh, multiple injuries are more likely, uh, large surface area to weight, um, they have higher caloric needs, and they do maintain their vital signs better for longer. Um, so oftentimes they will look more stable than they actually are. So airway differences, uh, they have an increased vagal response. They will braid a, they will brady on you very quickly when you're trying to intubate them. So you can treat that with uh, pretreatment of atropine or glycopyrrolate. Um, they have bigger tissue or bigger tongues and adenoid tissues, um, making OPAs and MPAs more uh, difficult to place, but also uh, more necessary to help keep their their airways open. Uh, epiglottis is floppy and more U-shaped. Uh, Miller blades are usually easier to intubate with than Max in kids. Um, their larynx is more anterior and cephalad, um, which makes it much more difficult to visualize sometimes. Uh, the cricoid ring is the most narrow airway portion. Um, you want to make sure that you're using a cuff tube. Trachea is narrow and smaller distance between the rings, so I can't necessarily do a regular crike on peds. That's where needle crike comes in. Um, trachea is shorter, so proper positioning is more important. And all large airways are more narrow, so they're going to have uh, higher airway resistance. Family is an important component of uh, change in, um, especially with pediatric trauma. We should be um, discussing frequently with, with family members in any patient's care, but it's especially important in pediatrics that you keep the parents updated on what you're doing. A lot of times in pediatric emergency departments, they allow the parents to be back with the patient even during aggressive resuscitations, including uh, ACLS. So it's important to be discussing with the parents what you're doing and what you're trying and what, what you're finding, um, getting that, that history from them as well. Um, you want to make sure that you have uh, contacted anytime there's significant pediatric trauma and a likelihood or potential that the patient may not make it. You want to early notify uh, whoever the clergy or, or, or staff uh is for that so that they can be present to assist with uh, the parents during that time. Uh, secondary survey. Uh, primary survey in pediatrics is the exact same as any other trauma resuscitation. So it's your airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. Um, your secondary survey has to be done. Once you've stabilized the patient through your primary survey, you have to do a good secondary survey on these patients. You want to make sure that you get a good ample history. You want to do your head to toe treat as you go. Uh, secondary survey, you want to make sure that they're up to date on their Tdap. If not, then you give them any antibiotics or given frequent rechecks of vital signs. And with pediatrics, you want to make sure that they're keeping a urine output of one ml per kilogram per hour. Um, so management of pediatric trauma IOs, sometimes kids can be really hard to get IVs on. IOs are quickly placed, but they have a maximum of 25 ml per minute, so they can't be used for the mass transfusion boluses that uh, that typical IVs can be. They're good to help while they're good, but you should be able to try to get some type of definitive line on a patient. Um, should not place an IO line in any fractured extremity. Um, you can umbilical vein cannulate up to a two-week-old. Um, you want to make sure that you're giving um, your blood products at a one-to-one -one ratio. So uh, typically your packed red blood cells are, are, are given as 10, 10 ml per kilo boluses. So whatever that, that will be 10 ml per kilo packed red blood cells, 10 ml per kilo FFP, and then making sure that you also give uh, platelets. Um, Cryoprecipitate, um, you want to make sure that you're giving that appropriately. That's dosed uh, at 0 0.1 to 0.2 bag per kilogram. So you're going to necessarily, that's going to be something you would check with your pharmacist on to make sure that it gets dosed right in the moment. Um, some access points 
for uh, IOs you can, for, in children. You've got your tibial uh, plateau. You've got your distal tibia, and you've got your femoral. You also can do, um, there is a humeral, and you can do an iliac, but typically you'll want to do uh, tibial or femoral in pediatrics. Management, again, we'll talk a little bit about the, the lethal triad of trauma or the triad of death. Um, that's that acidosis, coagulopathy, and hypothermia. If you wanted to turn this into a triangle of death, or not a triangle of death, a a diamond of death, then you can add in that fourth component of hypocalcemia, um, just making sure that you understand the concept of why we need to make sure that we're addressing hyperthermia, making sure that we're doing adequate fluid resuscitation to avoid that metabolic acidosis, and addressing the coagulopathy issues. Doesn't change for pediatrics. Pain control. Uh, in pediatrics, fentanyl is greater than morphine due to the hemodynamic properties and short uh, duration of action. You want to make sure that's that's the same for adults as well. Fentanyl for trauma is better than morphine. Um, quickly immobilize the broken stuff on peds. That will make a huge difference on on their uh, pain levels and their and their outcomes. Um, distract the child iPhone, TV, something to, to keep the child preoccupied with something else that's going on is perfectly appropriate. Um, stuff to do, again, x-rays, making sure you get a chest and a pelvis on it. If there's any concern for non-accidental trauma, then you need to do a skeletal survey. Um, CT, if severe trauma or the patient has any altered mental status. Um, if this is kind of a random one, but if there's an electrocution in-house without a current dysrhythmia, patients are pretty low risk. If there was a high voltage burn, uh, greater than 240 volt, then they require uh, prolonged monitoring. Again, here's a skeletal survey. A different, You'll get basically a radiograph of all the bones in the kid's body to take a look at it to make sure that there's not other signs of non-accidental trauma. Pediatric head injury, we talked about head injuries a little bit earlier, but pediatric head injury is the most common cause of death. Their head is bigger and weighs more comparatively to their body mass. Um, this can lead to more uh, brain parenchymal injuries, even if there are no skull fractures. Um, so making sure that we're uh, conscious of that and assessing for those types of injuries is important. We need to have a high clinical suspicion in these patients. Um, pediatric brains are less myelinated, thus there are more uh, issues with sharing forces, so we need to make sure that we're addressing those as well. Uh, history, um, what caused the head injury, what, did they fall from height, did they hit a surface, uh, what surface did they hit, was there any concern for substance abuse, um, was was the patient restrained in a motor vehicle? Were they ejected from a motor vehicle? Was there loss of consciousness? What's their personality? Are they acting like their normal personality? Were they able to ambulate? Do they have a normal gait? Are there any of these significant findings? Um, impact seizures. Did they have the seizure post-impact? Was it breezed with return of consciousness? Um, anything along those lines. If, the, if it was 20 minutes post-impact, more risk, get imaging and neuro. Uh, cerebral perfusion pressure, that's your mean arterial pressure minus your intracranial pressure. That's a measurement of your brain perfusion. Narrow limits, too little, ischemia, too much, high intracranial pressure. Need euvolemia, if blood pressure drops, so does your MAP. Um, you want a minimum of 50 millimeters of mercury in children, 70 millimeters of mercury in adults. Uh, again, eval, it's with children. You have a modified GCS, so make sure that you're using your modified GCS. Do a quick... AVPU evaluation on them, see what their mental status is. Are they alert? Are they verbal and talking or cooing or making noises? Do they only respond to um, painful stimuli? Do they open their eyes when you talk to them as a kid? Say, hey, you know, whatever. Do they open their eyes and look at you? Are they unresponsive? Um, scalp injuries, um, making sure that you're checking all of those things. They have, uh, they can significantly injure their periosteum or their connective tissue, you want to check and make sure the galea is not violated at all. Um, so here's some uh, non, I guess, here's some 
pediatric head injury type things. So this is uh, caput uh, secundium. This is a uh, finding that is pretty consistent with uh, findings consistent with uh, a newborn baby. This is from pressure of the uterus or the vaginal wall during uh, typical birth. Uh, freely mobile crosses suture lines. It's nothing big or scary. Here is a subgaleal uh, hematoma. This is frequently seen um, in in children post birth when they uh, OBs had to use something like a vacuum extractor or something like that. Um, pretty uh, low risk injuries. Here's a cephalohematoma. Again, blood underneath the periosteum, but does not cross suture lines. And we'll talk about some skull fractures here now. Um, many occur differently. Um, linear uh, is the most common, usually no therapy. They have good outcomes. Uh, diastatic is ones that cross through the suture lines. Uh, they can have uh, these leptomeningeal cysts that may develop. And then there's basilar skull fractures, CSF presence, and it's got all the clinical findings of a basal skull fracture. So here's an example of a linear, linear skull fracture. Here's an example of a diastatic skull fracture. And then here's, again, battle sign, raccoon eyes, a CSF. Uh, leak, hemotympanum, here's uh, CSF otorrhea. So those are all some findings that are concerning for basal skull fractures. Um, head injury again, concussion, that's a brain insult with transient impairment of consciousness, um, rapid baseline recovery with a normal CT. Um, they can have brain contusions, that's usually from coup contra coup, uh, with and without loss of consciousness. Um, you can look at that uh, video there, uh, just co copy and paste that in there. Um, epidural hematomas, traditionally lucid interval that worsens. Uh, children can be different. Venous bleeding that delays symptoms. Um, so you want to make sure that you, you monitor those um, a little bit closer. Subdural hematobas, um, toddlers, infants, again, bridging veins with overlying fraction, fracture. This is a common finding in children with shaken baby. So uh, epidural there on the left, uh, subdural there on the right. Um, neither are good findings and are concerning. They, they need admission in pediatric neurosurgery. Um, Herniation syndromes are similar in children as adults, like we already talked about in a previous lecture. You want to make sure that you perform good and accurate neuro exams frequently. Um, treatment, again, is going to be hyperventilation um, for a short period until pupillary function returns while you're getting your other treatments on board, your hypertonic saline, your pentabarb, your mannitol. Um, and neurosurgery is either performing a burr hole or a craniotomy or something. Um, typically with children, it's going to be creating autobies because burr holes don't work as well. Um, and they'll go from there. Signs and symptoms of high ICP in children. Again, headache, stiff necks, photophobia, altered state of consciousness, uh, continued vomiting. If you have any cranial nerve involvements or papilledema, if they have the classic uh, hypertension, bradycardia, hypoventilation, or if they have any seizure with the corticated or cerebrate posturing. Infants. Full fontanelle, splitting sutures, uh, persistent uh, paradoxical irritability, uh, altered state of consciousness, um, persistent eminus, emesis, or uh, that setting sun sign. Uh, radiographs of the skull, uh, x ray skull, skeletal survey, function of VP sunt, penetrating wounds, scalps, and foreign bodies. Not typically very useful. Um, typically, you'll get x-rays, skeletal survey, you can get a shunt series as needed, 
uh, for kids who have ventricular peritoneal shunts, but CT is the mainstay and uh, definitely is what you'll go to if you're considering imaging of the head. Um, if they're older than two years old and they have a neuro normal neurological exam and no significant red flag symptoms and they're PCAR negative, may not need necessarily to have any imaging. Um, however, if there's any of those uh, forcible insult neuro deficits, GCS less than 14, they're not PCAR negative, like you need to have that conversation or do imaging. Um, if less than one, hard to see some neuro milestones, image for any high high risk or high concerning symptoms, loss of consciousness, protracted vomiting, poor feeding, suspicion of abuse. Um, those would be reasons to do your, your imaging studies. So, uh, Cervical spine injury, one in a hundred children in the U.S. Uh, annually. There's this spinal cord injury without radiologic abnormalities is found in about one in four to one half. Uh, MRI is not included. Um, kids have many anatomical differences, bigger heads, makes their neck injuries more significant. Um, so if one examiner finds pain is enough, you may have to, uh, is enough to go ahead and consider immobilization and spinal cord evaluation. So different types of spinal cord injuries. You've got your central cord syndrome, um, comes from cervical extension. Yeah, it's going to be arms greater than legs findings, distal greater than proximal. Uh, anterior cord syndromes are going to be cervical flexion injuries, uh, usually complete motor paralysis with pain and temperature loss, but they have retained position and vibratory findings. Um, brown saccard is hemisection of, the ipsil hemisection of the spinal cord with ipsilateral loss of motor function and proprioception and contralateral loss of pain and temperature function. Just remember on on children, uh, pediatric patients, you want to make sure that you have a low threshold for imaging. Um, you want to make sure that you're getting uh, appropriate imaging. Used to be uh, plain films of the neck, but anymore with uh, the lower dose CTs, it's almost better to just get a CT cervical spine if you're concerned for any type of, of injury to the spinal cord. Um, and just keeping in mind that they can have that spinal cord without uh, radiographic evidence that you need to be concerned about. So this again is that three views, AP, odontoid, and lateral. Um, you draw your lines along the uh, uh, cortical margins, making sure that they don't have any subluxation or pseudo-subluxation or, or concerning findings. So there's that pre-dental space and the pre-vertebral space. Again, here's your lines that you should be able to draw. So you can draw it on your patients here, the anterior, posterior, and spinal laminar lines. Um, here's this Swishuk's line. Uh, that's important in imaging studies, but not necessarily something that's important for, for you to memorize or even really consider too much because a lot of times you're just going to be getting a CT of the neck for that. So one more time, uh, lines of alignment on lateral radiographs, just so you have a general idea of what you should be looking for. Um, spinal cord injuries, you have two phases of it. You have your direct, um, that's initial, largely ir irreversible, uh, starts at the event. Um, indirect, these are your preventable or reversible. This is due to uh, hypoxemia, ischemia, tissue toxicity, and these are the ones that are, that are our job to pre prevent. Um, these are the ones we need to identify and treat appropriately with, uh, you know, spinal cord protocols of increasing, you know, keeping their maps elevated and, and immobilization and, and fluid management, doing all the things that we're supposed to be doing appropriately. Briefly talk about uh, spinal shock versus neurogenic shock. Um, these are fine. Spinal shock is findings of spinal cord injury, including flaccid paralysis of the skeletal and smooth muscles. Appearance of hypovolemia due to low systemic uh, vascular resistance and uh, usually resolves in hours. Um, you'll be able to tell this by return of the uh, bubble cavernosis reflex and rectal tone. Um, if they if they get rectal tone back and continue to have flaccid paralysis, then there might be uh, 
uh, continued issues. Neurogenic shock uh, occurs post-injury to uh, spinal cord above T6. Uh, they lose their sympathetic tone. They end up having hypotension in the face of unopposed parasympathetics. Uh, they end up having bradycardia. Um, you can give atropine, glycopyrrolate, vasopressors, um, lots of different medications to try to do that. You know, some cardiothoracic, pediatric cardiothoracic injuries, um, most commonly due to blunt trauma, uh, kids are diaphragm breathers, muscle fibers fatigue rapidly, they have poor thoracic wall musculature unlike adults, so they'll have an increased respiratory rate. Um, Uh, not vital capacity due to anat anatomy of the chest wall. Um, their rib cage com is compliant. They'll have no significant external injury, but it'll mask significant internal injuries. So again, pneumothorax may not be appreciated. They, you may not appreciate decreased breath sounds. Um, you'll want to put a mid chest, mid axillary chest tube in place due to developing chest tissue. Um, if they uh, you can observe it if it's less than 20% and they're not mechanically ventilated. Open pneumothorax, uh, three-sided, now recommended to do a four-sided occlusive dressing. Um, tension pneumothorax is harder to diagnose. They have short necks, increased soft tissue. Um, you just want to make sure that you're, you're monitoring for that. Hemothorax, get an upright x-ray from severe impact, placed uh, tube laterally and point posterior medial. Um, Pulmonary contusion is very common from blunt injury. Uh, you just do supportive care. And then traumatic diaphragmatic hernia, uh, lap belts in an MVC, uh, causes a huge increase in intra-abdominal pressure. You might also consider thinking about chance fractures, which are uh, burst fractures of the spinal cord with disruption of the posterior li ligament. Um, most common on the left side because liver protects the right, and you want to place an NG tube and avoid uh, BVM if possible. Um, most common cardiovascular injury in kids is just is again card myocardial contusion. And tachycardia is the most common finding. Might also have elevated cardiac mar markers, and you may need to admit for monitoring. Uh, tamponade is rare. Uh, penetrating wounds can cause it. Tachycardia, distant heart tones, uh, Bex, again, Bex triad. Get an EKG um, and a bedside ultrasound. Uh, this is Commodio cortis. Um, it is a diagnosis of pediatrics. It's a uh, sudden impact to the an anterior chest wall. It causes cardiac functions to cease, uh, usually degrades rapidly into ventricular fibrillation and death. Um, it's not, it has a pretty poor prognosis. Uh, pediatric abdominal injuries um, is the third most common cause of death after head and thoracic injuries. Uh, their anatomy sucks. Uh, they have less mesentery, less fat, uh, bigger organs and more flexible ribs. Uh, most common cause is blunt, uh, usually from lap belt injuries. Um, they can end up with significant intra-abdominal injuries, such as small bowel injuries, chance fractures, um, uh, a lot of others. A common one to consider in pediatrics is the handlebar injury, up to one day post-injury. Um, a kid has a bike wreck and hits his epigastrum on the handlebars of his bike. Typically, they'll have epigastric pain. Uh, it's a duodenal hematoma until proven otherwise. You may also want to consider issues with the uh, pancreas, spleen, and kidney uh, in that injury pattern. Um, patients may present with tachypnea from impaired diaphragmatic excursion, tenderness to uh, palpation, ecchymosis, and sometimes in shock-like state. Um, there is this CARES sign. Uh, it's left shoulder pain secondary to a splenic injury. In pediatrics, um, most common abdominal injury in pediatrics is to the spleen. The second most common is uh, liver, but the liver injury is the most common lethal abdominal injury. Uh, remember that uh, renal injury is retroperitoneal, so if kids have ecchymosis, hematuria, or dull back pain, you need to be considering retroperitoneal injuries. Uh, oral contrast for pediatric CT is of no, of no benefit. Briefly, we'll talk about 
pediatric non-accidental trauma uh, is sometimes difficult to diagnose. You must maintain a high index of suspicion. Uh, many injuries and non-accidental trauma can also happen in accidental trauma. Uh, it's important then that your history must match your injury patterns. For example, you're a one-month-old, can't roll over, therefore if the mother provides a history that the patient rolled off the bed, that's not a consistent history with the injury patterns. Um, many injury patterns exist in non-accidental trauma. You want to look for bruising that doesn't match the history, uh, skull fractures in young infants, intracranial bleeds, fractures, um, burns, malnourishment, and uh, bruises in multiple stages of healing. Um, there is a significantly high mortality in uh, pediatric non-accidental trauma if the sentinel vent is not a detected initially. Um, in high-income countries, it is estimated that around 4 to 16 percent of children are physically abused annually. Um, it is the third leading cause of death in children between one and four years of age. Um, most recently published data from the National Data Archive on Child Abuse and Neglect reported that 1.25 million cases occurred annually in the U.S. and that nearly one in eight children are abused before the age of 18. Um, most abused children are, are ch victims of neglect versus, uh, versus physical abuse. Um, a smaller percentage, about 17.6, are victims of seven, uh, physical abuse. Um, there are still more than 1,500 child deaths annually attributed to uh, physical abuse alone. There is some concern that only approximately 20% of actual abuse cases are reported annually, however. So it's important for providers, especially in the emergency department, to maintain that high index of suspicion and, and ensure that our history and physical exam findings uh, match up and that if, if, there, if we do have that index of suspicion that we pursue further imaging and testing and, and consult case management. So disposition, um, surgery, neurosurgery, neurology, um, it kind of depends on, on what findings we find throughout there. Um, we want to make sure that we're ensuring great communication between the, the, pr the providers and the care team, the care team and the family, and making sure that we know what's going on and everybody's wishes. And then one of the most difficult things we do in emergency medicine is cessation of care of a pediatric patient. So um, it's important to have the family present if possible while you're while, while coding a pediatric patient. Um, have them involved, seeing what we're doing, um, knowing that it seems counterintuitive to have the family there, but it, it, it is important that they get to see our resuscitation efforts and see that we're doing everything that we can and then, and keep them involved in in the care of the patient and give them an opportunity to, to give their wishes um, and then go from there. And then following that, it's important to make sure that you take care of yourself and your team after any pediatric uh, cessation of care. So with that, we are done with that marathon. Um, if you have any questions, uh, contact myself or Dr. Gardner and we'd be happy to answer them. Uh, these are my references, and that is it.